if we look with Chinese lenses, this is an achievement. This is something meaning that they passed the test of convertibility. Philip, if we talk about China, it's such a hot topic at the moment, but China's weak weakening yuan isn't just spurring money out of the country, it's also impacting money coming in, FDI. But what is the situation with Chinese money in Switzerland? So first, if you allow me, I would like to make a few comments about your four words. The first thing is, uh, recently there has been a lot of turmoil and comments about the slowdown of the growth rate, about uh, the Chinese yuan devaluation, about uh, the recent closure also for one day of the Shanghai Stock Exchange, and of course, those events have created some kind of uh, uncertainty, if not volatility, and obviously investors don't like that. No, at all. Well, but as Ti Dian Tiam recently said, well, China is now moving from an export-driven economy into a consumption-driven economy. Now the question is, what about Switzerland? Switzerland had a wonderful opportunity from 2008 to 2012 when they had a branch from the Chinese Bank of China here uh, in Geneva. But as you know, it was later sold to Julius Baer. Indeed. Now, the problem with that is uh, what did we do now? Uh, last year, in January, to be precise, uh, there was a swap agreement concluded between the Bank of China and the Swiss National Bank. That was a good step, but net the next step is to have a clearing house. And in that case, of course, from the Chinese point of view, it could only be the branch office of a Chinese bank. And that's what happened precisely on uh, the 15th of January this year, where the China Construction Bank opened a branch, an operational branch in Zurich. So now we are in a position to compete and to do things properly on that side. Nevertheless, one has to know that up to now, 90% uh, uh, of the Swiss Chinese transactions are still being made in Swiss franc, in US dollar or in euros. If we do talk about opportunity, Chinese acquisitions hit record levels in 2015 as China Inc. spread their wings. We also saw the IMF you know, had a, a second look at the Huan and brought it into the basket. A lot of times the government is trying to say, you know, here we are, trying to increase its influence, but there's all this market volatility that we've been speaking about. Is it futile? And also, was the IMF's decision perhaps the kiss of death for the currency? Well, you have to look at facts. First, uh, uh, the basket uh, reassessment was done in November last year and will be effective on October 1st this year. It was even qualified by the Wall Street Journal as a non-event for investors. Oh. Yeah, which is a bit hypocritical knowing that this move wouldn't have been possible without the US backing. Okay. Now, what is the situation? Along the new basket distribution, the US will have 42%, uh, the Euro or Europe uh, will have 31%, uh, then you will have the Chinese Yuan with almost 11%, plus the British pound and the Japanese Yen with 8% each. So that will be the new distribution. But you may imagine that it takes some time to feel visible effects of such a move. So from the Chinese perspective, well, it is some kind of international recognition for their currency, for their economy. They are now the second world power, economic power. And once again, if we look with Chinese lenses, this is an achievement. This is something meaning that they passed the test of convertibility. Of course, we all know that in such a case, uh, there are issues with one, the fact that they need transparency, you need access to reliable data, and of course they have to pursue the reform of the financial system. Those are the conditions for the Chinese uh, authorities, but instead of uh, uh, being alarmist, I would rather say this is more of a hug, a big American hug, oh. than a kiss of death. <laughs> that is so nice, that, that's a lovely way to look at it. But if we do think about perception, Chinese officials are obviously, you know, they're going, they're 
put in so much effort and to try and say it's okay with the plan, they're trying to look at the depreciation of it and say everything is fine, it is going down, how low do you think it can go? Well, first you have to look at the fundamentals. Economists always do. If you look at the fundamentals, you have a huge amount of foreign currency reserves in China. You all, we all know that. Second, uh, the growth rate is still interesting from an international perspective, because we are talking about 5 to 6 percent, which is quite an achievement to be done in such condition. And of course, uh, there is also a very positive commerce, commercial balance sheet. So all those factors may contribute, in my views, to the fact that the long-term perspective of the UN are rather positive, uh, knowing the fact also that the Chinese government will never relinquish fully its power over its currency like uh, the US did. So those factors uh, are changing clearly the perspective. And the last element you have to consider is that China is no longer an emerging country. They are the second world economic power. It's certainly, China is certainly a power to be reckoned with. But it's been wonderful speaking to you and sharing your perspectives today. Thank you so much for coming in. Thank you. Thank you. OK, well, that's all from Philippe and myself for the moment. But there's plenty more on Dukascopy TV. So click back. Thank you for watching. Thank <laughs> you.